This was taken a week ago. If you've done anything to him. In the year of our Lord, 1988, on the 22nd day of June, there was something that was birthed unto the world that both enriched, enlightened, and embrightened the world as a whole. And that thing was me! Ha! Ah! Yeah, you're expecting me to say something else, huh? Yeah. Uh, June 22nd, 1988, the day and month and year of my birth. The 22nd of June, 1988. So yeah, that's my birthday, and uh, yeah, I'm an old man. Don't, don't, don't you say a f***ing word. <laughs> I'm sorry. So yeah, um, okay, as you all know, I'm not here to just talk about the day I was born, or the, or the month or the year. Specifically, I'm here to talk about who framed Roger Rabbit by watching the Nostalgia Critics uh, review of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And if I can be perfectly honest with you, uh, I have a very special connection with this film because this film and me both uh, came out on the same day. So uh, yeah, I popped out onto this world uh, <laughs> on June 22nd, 1988, and this film just so happened to be released the exact same day as the day I was born. I was just, still to this day, I can't believe, like, I share such an amazing birthday with, uh, with, uh, some, with something like this. Oh, and also, I share a birthday with Bruce Campbell. I take great pride in that, because Bruce Campbell is hands down one of my favorite human beings ever. As a matter of fact, I was born exactly exactly on Bruce Campbell's 30th birthday. Yeah, I, I feel great about that. that. That just makes me just so so happy, makes me smile. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh there, there's a lot I can be happy about on June 22nd. And specifically on June 22nd, 1988, the day I was born. Uh <laughs> Okay, I'll stop now. I'll stop. But um yeah, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a great, great, you know, hybrid animation slash live action film. Uh, and honestly, hearing you know one of my heroes of you know internet critics, you know internet critics, uh, Doug Walker, talk about it. And, and here's the thing: I I know that there's a lot of people out there who say I can't believe you still react to Doug Walker. He's such a horrible person. I'm like, no, he's just a person. I mean, he has likes and dislikes he has opinions that people don't agree with and in all honesty that's okay it is okay to have different opinions than other people because if you have different opinions from other people and you're able to defend your points i mean this is the thing about logical like back and forth discussions that i think is missing nowadays people aren't willing to talk about stuff instead they just want to dig their heels in the sand turn their nose up and just just you know put, put their fingers in their ears and go la 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 none of this is real none of this is i'm right you're wrong la 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 stop being such a child stop being such a child and grow up and realize that you know your opinion is not a fact you know and, and that's the one thing i've always like that's the one thing people do nowadays is that's just like when people uh talk mad shit about us uh, they talked mad shit about us whenever we were talking about how we were critical of Fallout 76. You know, whenever it was announced at the Bethesda E3 event, I think back in 2018. And when it released, um, yeah, all of my fears and doubts. And here's the thing, we, we weren't even saying that we hated it. We're like, oh, this is going to be the worst game ever. I'm just like, we were just like, I don't think this is going to work. And it didn't. And a lot of people are playing it now and say that it does work and that it is good. But, I mean, honestly, just the response from the fandom was absolutely atrocious. As a matter of fact, I made this... I, I made this right here a long time ago. And I'm going to share it with you all right here, right now. Let's see if I can uh, go ahead and... Yeah. So... I, uh, I made this a long time ago, and, uh, <laughs> this is something 
I gotta say, when I made it, I was very proud of, and I didn't share it because I was just like, I think, because it was right after we watched the Internet Historian video, and uh, he, he said in a much more eloquent and much more well-presented way, but me, this is just how I felt after the reception of Fallout 76. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a meme I'm actually very, very proud of. I, I cannot, I, I cannot, uh, and I literally named it The Last Laugh, which, I mean, that's honestly to me one of the best things ever. But anyway, enough of me jibber-jabbering, enough of me gloating and, you know, bragging about, oh, look, you know, the day he was born. It's like, no, I'm just, I'm just being silly, man. I, I'm an, I'm a reaction. I'm part of a reaction channel, dude. I'm silly. That's, that's part of the thing. <laughs> anyway, let's get this up on screen. Let's give this a watch. This is Who Framed Roger Rabbit by the Nostalgia Critic. Here we go. This episode brought to you by DoorDash. Hey. Yeah, that brings you food Actually, you're Actually, uh, right installed DoorDash. Right to your door. Also brought to you by MeUndies. With a variety of prints and sizes, MeUndies. however you want to be you, we got you covered. Jesus. Every time. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Guy, remember it? Oh, I can't hold it in. We're going to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Hey. The 1988 groundbreaking blend of animation and live action was the equivalent of every little kid's Avengers Endgame at the time. Most of the cartoon characters we grew up adoring were finally seen side by side. Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, Droopy, Woody Woodpecker. Plus a slew of new memorable faces like Baby Herman, Jessica Rabbit, the Weasels, and of course, good old Roger. <laughs> and I'm happy to announce we have a special guest on this episode, Roger Rabbit himself. Say hello, Roger. Roger? Huh? What? What? Oh, I'll have your rent money in a year or two. Roger, we have a video to do, and the contract you signed specifically said sober. Oh, so you've worked with entertainers before. Roger, are you okay? Better than ever. Go ahead, unzip your pants and we can get this over with. Dude, it's not that kind of video. What happened to you, man? You're a big star. Yeah, I was going to be. Everybody loved me when the movie came out. What, people don't now? No. People don't even know I exist. What? Some film historian will bring me up here and there. But then I'm forgotten like always. Actually, yeah, not a lot was done with you afterwards, huh? At the time, the film was built up as the next evolution of cinema, with Spielberg producing, technical wizardry pushed to the limit. And Robert and Zemeckis directing. I mean, you had Bob Hoskins, you had Christopher Lloyd, you had so many great character actors in this. God, I love this film. It's so great. Hottest directors at the time, Robert Zemeckis at the helm. And that's one of the reasons so many copyrights were bent to bring characters together you would never see together. Never! But yeah. aside from an occasional crossover, this mix of real life and hand-drawn animation never went that far. Even you just got a couple of animated shorts and then practically vanished. Hey, I had a theme park! That parents took their kids to whenever they wanted to sip on vodka from the sun lotion bottles. So, what have you been doing for money? What or who? Oh god. Oh. The stuttering pee thing can make a lot of people happy, if you know what I mean. Roger, I had no idea. It's not all bad. I do birthday parties sometimes. Well, that's nice. There's still some children interested in you. They're over 40. Yikes. The stuttering pee trick comes in handy there, too. Oh. Well, look, Roger, I know you're not as big a star as Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny Please, or Betty Boop. Eddie. You think Boop is bigger than me? Well, that's not what I... 
Yeah. Christ. Yeah. But your movie is more than what? just a technical landmark. It's a storytelling landmark. Yes. Lots of folks assume because there's kids' cartoons and it, it must be meant for children. But not Instead, only was this isn't. made at a time when PG really had a lot more of an edge to it. What the hell is wrong with that take? What? Son of a bitch. But the way the film is written and directed displays great talent in how to quickly and subtly get across a lot of emotion and information. Yeah. And because drunk people love saying how terrible they are so they can be told how great they are. That's not true. I'm worse than Bin Laden. I'm going to point out why this film deserves to be analyzed over three decades later. Yes! So sit back and enjoy another look at Who Framed Roger Rabbit. No. Then get drunk and stay out of my way. Oh, so you know my family's crest. Way ahead of you. The film opens with a baby Herman and Roger Rabbit short. Roger is voiced by Charles Fleischer, who, yes, did dress like a rabbit on set to get into character. And when he voiced Benny the Cab, he appropriately became a car. Oh. Why, I'll take care of him like he with my own brother. Though Roger is certainly designed and talks like a cartoon from the 40s, the short itself is much more modern with fast editing, extreme angles, and more fluidity. I kind of like that because it sets up what kind of a reality you're in for. One that dives deep into little details, but leaves the bigger questions vague. How do these tunes exist? Are they drawn to life? Do they evolve with humans? These details aren't as important as making it clear that animated shorts are apparently filmed in one shot. With the title cards, fake legs, and even live music being halted when Roger messes up his line. Can we lose the playback, please? Roger, you're killing me, killing me. That line, by the way, is Roger seeing birds instead of stars. How does a tune control that? Again, this detail's not as important as knowing that for tunes, this is a line, not a prop. This Roger, he keeps blowing his line. Rabbit sees stars, not birds, stars! It's a lot like Edward Scissorhands. You don't ask how someone created a man or where those giant blocks of ice came from. Those details just aren't as important as the details that push the emotions and story forward. Like, take this incredible one shot that seamlessly goes from animation to live action, shows you how cartoons are made in this world, that Roger apparently has force powers, and introduces you to Eddie, played by Bob Hoskins. Uh, again... World that Roger apparently has force... Again, I read, I, I read behind the scenes stuff on this, and a lot of it, they just use strings. They use, like, very intricate, very well-hidden strings. And they would often have the light appearing straight, appearing straight down so that you couldn't tell where the strings were. Because if you have light blasting on it from the sides or all over as much, yeah, it, it, again, dude, just the amount of work that went into this film is immense. Powers and introduces you to Eddie, played by Bob Hoskins. Rest in the peace, big man. staging in this one shot alone must have been insane, but that's not even what I want to focus on. I want to focus on this few seconds of Eddie's introduction. Tunes. The way he said that one word shows he hates tunes. Taking a swig of whiskey shows he's an alcoholic. Putting it in his gun holster shows he values his drink over protecting himself, and probably his work. And him being there at all shows he's desperate because someone wants him for a low-level job, and he obviously wouldn't be there by choice. It's crazy how much information they get across to you in just that one Conveyance. shot, and most of it's nonverbal. This really is master filmmaking, even when not focusing on the brilliant animation directed by the late great Richard Williams. We'll get to his contribution in a little bit. Mr. Maroon, Mr. Valiant's here too. Eddie is brought to cartoon producer R.K. Maroon, by the way, voice of the gorilla later, who says to help Roger with his lines, he wants Eddie to take some sexy pictures of his wife Jessica to calm him down. Get me a couple of nice, juicy pictures I can wise the wrap it up with. Admittedly, for a detective, he should have smelled he was being set up, but as everybody mocks him for, he's not exactly in his prime. From the smell of him, I'd say it was the booze talking. He looks like a sensitive and sober fellow. <laughs> Did you change your name to Jack Daniels? And pretty much everything in the next few minutes sets this up. He's trying to use the check on the trolley. He doesn't own a car. He fixes his broken sign. He throws out his bills. He knows all the bar flies and even borrowed money from his girlfriend. Fifty bucks? Where's the rest? My other man prostitutes pay me back a lot faster. Every little detail is <laughs> setting up this character through a visual medium. Hey, mister, ain't you got a car? Who needs a car in L.A.? We got the best public transportation system in the world. May a nearby forest fire start if I'm wrong. Thanks for the cigarettes. Give me five 80s, PG. Mm -mm. Damn. Later that night, he goes to the Ink and Paint Club where tunes are allowed to perform, but not attend. This is a satire of the Cotton Club where black people were allowed to be on stage, but not in the seats. 
In fact, the original book used tunes as an allegory for racism. Which, if this was made by Disney today, you know it'd be hammered in like sin, but- Oh my freaking god, you know it. Oh my god. Yeah, there's conveyance, and then there's, you see, there's subtlety, conveyance, then there's hitting people over the head with a literal sledgehammer of righteousness. Criminy. But this film decides to be a little more subtle. Thank there are you. a lot of little clues that add up, as the humans rarely consider the inequality between the two of them. They just see him as goofy entertainment to take advantage of. No, there's no justice for tombs anymore. Strictly humans only, okay? Our left can be a very powerful thing. Why, sometimes in life, it's the only weapon we have. Again, a lot of emotional information mm -hmm. that's gotten across in a natural way that doesn't feel manipulative. Yes! And yeah, when I was a kid, this was my Godzilla vs. Kong. Yes! Does anybody understand what this duck is saying? Seeing these two together blew my mind. It was amazing not only <laughs> to see them interacting off each other, but the original voice actors performing them as well. Yep, you had Clarence... Sort of. I, I think you had uh, Clarence, uh, Ducky Nash, and Tony Anselmo. Or no, no, I think... No, no, because Clarence Ducky Nash died in 85, so this was Tony Anselmo. Tony Anselmo still sounds great. Mel Blanc was still alive to voice Daffy, and Donald is a mix of replacement Tony Anselmo and archived audio of the original actor, Clarence Nash. It's also cool that Eddie is still friends with some tunes, like Betty Boop, still voiced by the original actress, Mae Quistel. Life's been kind of slow since cartoons went to color, but I still got it, Eddie. Yeah. Boop, boop, be doop, boop, boop. So, can I get a menu, or... Why not? After meeting the owner of Toontown, Marvin Acme, played by Jay Sherman. Oh, I mean Stubby K, sorry, I always confuse those two. This is Stubby K! We're introduced to Shit. Roger's wife, Jessica. The first... furry? I want you to know I love you. I've loved you more than any woman's ever loved a rabbit. I'm not even... No, I'm not gonna dig into it. Nope. Nope. Mm -mm. But I get the feeling not as much as any man has ever loved a rabbit. Oh, shut up, Doug. Kevin I never Turner, did. Accompanied by, I think, the crows from Dumbo. I gotta deal with being a minority and the minority of the minority and nobody support my ass. Let's just call it Jessica's intro was many kids' sexual awakening. I know so many boys who went from Yeah, yeah, girls are stupid. Well, well you know, they're, uh, uh... Uh-huh. Ah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. Ah, Jessica Rabbit. She's married to Roger Rabbit. What a lucky girl. <laughs> I hear his dick is huge. Unless <laughs> another bombshell <laughs> tune, so she is a Doug, what the fuck? <laughs> oh Christ! Legit interesting character, despite her proportions being pretty hilarious. Impossible. She looks like an hourglass if the Sahara Desert filled it up. She Impossible. Very mysteriously. While the villain of the film is rather clear, you're not always sure whose side she's on. Does she love Roger, or is she using him as a cartoon human? Is she more on the toon side or people side? Through most of the film, either is believable. Plus, everyone's reaction here is priceless. And... Oh. Oh! 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 Doug, why? <laughs> is priceless. And... <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a little arrow and... at the top. He's found sleeping in her dressing room. The gorilla bodyguard tosses him out. Booga booga booga. Burn. While roaming down Gotham City, he peeks into her dressing room and finds her and Marvin Acme playing patty cake. Literally. Of course, is literally playing patty cake. But to a tune that's home base and purchasing the 1927 Yankees. I don't believe it. It can't be. It can't be. I love the faster he looks at it, it actually starts to animate like a That's... real <laughs> I noticed that too. <laughs> I noticed that when I was younger. Oh my gosh. Just, you... Dude, the literal amount of just layers of stuff in this, I still... Oh, God. 
Acne bear traps. Look at that back there. Just Jesus. But probably the biggest shock about this is, despite not seeing Roger and Jessica together often, you do weirdly buy them as a couple. They're polar opposites, yeah. but the way they talk about each other still shows they care for one another. No, 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 I love my husband. You've got me all wrong. I get the light of my life, the apple of my eye, the green of my coffee. Think Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft if Brooks was less animated. This is followed by not only a great moment, but one of my favorite moments in film history. We see Eddie hanging up his hat on a Maltese falcon, nice touch, and looking <laughs> over old pictures of his brother, as we're given a 100% yeah. visual history of their life Eddie together. and Teddy. It's hard to cite every detail in this one shot. The Betty Boop doll indicates maybe he was nicer to her because his brother liked her. The picture of their dad and them in the circus shows how fun-loving he used to be while also foreshadowing his tumbling act. The headline shows he used to work with tunes a lot, though how did Goofy get accused of this when Donald has the more damning footage? And Hoskins' look here- That's a propaganda- mm. Along with the stellar music is enough to make anyone teary-eyed. And on top of that, in the same shot, they had to change the background to mourning, empty his bottle of alcohol, take off his jacket, adjust the lighting, and all without their shadows ever getting in the way or running into the camera operator- it hits you what an emotional and technical achievement this one shot really was. Christ, this movie is so good. Yes! He's awoken by Lieutenant Santino, played by Richard Lepardmentier, who informs him that Roger apparently killed Marvin Acme last night. Apparently. Just like a tune to drop a safe in a guy's head. Sorry, Eddie. What do you say we go to a piano bar later? Ooh. Boy, Jesus. Acme's blood must have been .0 invisible, because there's not a drop of it anywhere. <laughs> Ow! We're then introduced to Judge Doom, played by Christopher Lloyd, who, brace yourself, is the bad guy. Yeah. No! I think this is more like Columbo, where they make it clear who the villain is, and the mystery is around why and how they'll be discovered. Hell, the dude literally has wind blowing in his cape in every shot. No matter, the rabbit won't get far, my men will find him. I think, too, that no he reasons. really looks like a toon disguised as an intimidating human. He reminds me of the bug from Men in Black, like every second he wants to break out of this yeah. false body. With artificial looking skin, exaggerated features, and teeth so white it makes Simon Cowell look less like the mask. Ow! Dude, Jesus, Doug is going in on this. <laughs> also, uh, his movements as well are what give him away uh, on the second watch of the film. Did you find the rabbit? No! He says he and his hired weasels are looking for Roger in between random shoe killing. <laughs> this! Okay, this scarred the shit out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> I saw this film when I was like five or six. Oh. This literally just made me go, No! I've never felt sorry for an inanimate object before. Although it's animated heat. Oh, God, I just. Ugh. The only liquid known to kill tunes called the dip. He melts Nancy Cartwright chew. No, really, that's Nancy Cartwright. Random. And while a lot of people were horrified by this scene, I have to admit, I found it kind of funny. Doug! You evil bastard. It's so over the top dark. I swear it served as a roadmap for Zemeckis' Christmas Carol. <laughs> How the shoe does absolutely. Whoa. Oh. Absolutely nothing, and he just kills it. I love how the red paint looks like blood. I love how Santino has to turn away because it's so horrific. When a guy who gets choked by Vader can't bear to look at <laughs> That's something, right. you know hard <laughs> shit is going down. <laughs> I love it. And it also shows that despite Eddie's prejudice against tunes, even he can't take any joy out of this. Though it'd be kind of funny if he did. But this is how we handle things down in Toontown. I'd think you of all people would appreciate that. Hey, you know, while you're at it, could you maybe throw these guys in there too? Oh, yes. I agree with all of these. Snarf, snarf, scrappy dappy doo! And the useless sack of crap known as Caillou. And the map, yeah, yeah. Although, map, I'm not as. Mm. Ugh. Hello, my name is Dor, and I'm in a dance. Hi, Dor. I make a lot of these 
This is the best I could do this week. Did you forget that important <laughs> thing at the store? Now you can get snacks, drinks, and household essentials in 30 minutes with DoorDash. DoorDash connects you with the restaurants you love right now and right to your door. And now you can get the grocery essentials you need with DoorDash too. Get drinks, snacks, and other household items delivered in under an hour. Ordering is easy. Open the DoorDash app, choose what you want from where you want, and your items will be left safely outside your door with the contactless delivery drop-off setting. With over 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Popeye's, Chipotle, and the Cheesecake Factory. Boom! Door Dory Dory Dash Dash. That's my catchphrase. I think I'm going to the offer for a limited time. Our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more. When you download the DoorDash app and enter the code Nostalgia2021, that's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code Nostalgia2021. Can I hear that offer again? Of course, that's Nostalgia2021 for 25% <laughs> off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. So get what you need today. Why? Somebody's knocking at my door. Who could it be? Why it's pee on these? This one I have no excuse for. Summer is coming in hot. Literally, oh, but with pee on and soft as heck fabrics, you can soak up the sun and feel cool for the summer. With a mix of classic colors and adventurous prints perfect for summer, express yourself in your own unique way. Because me undies believes that comfort is about more than what's touching your skin. Yar, it's me about undies. feeling comfortable in your own skin. No, seriously, it's stuff's pretty cool. Like, the fabric's really soft, the prints are really crazy and imaginative, and yeah, like, the door said it's summer it's getting really hot this stuff's really good go check it out it's uh, back to the door designed to be the softest thing you've ever worn the undies are energized by creativity and made for self-expression available in sizes from extra small to four extra large the undies has countless styles and prints to choose from so your fun <laughs> can have more fun that one was in the read i did not make that one up and wait say that again from, so your buns can have more fun that one was in the read i did not make that one up <laughs> This has a great awesome. offer for my viewers. For any first-time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. Beyondies also has the protection-free philosophy. If you're not satisfied with any product for any reason, they'll refund or exchange it. No caveats, no questions. To get your Dunder oh my god, your first they order and free shipping, office. go to meundies.com uh. slash nostalgia. That's meundies.com slash nostalgia. This has been the Beyondies door. Companies can have a door for a mascot, why not? Say, don't just look comfortable, be comfortable. Okay. Don't forget to check me out playing Kingdom Hearts Fridays from 6 to 9 on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. I think he's playing Kingdom Hearts Hope 3 now. Back at Eddie's office, Baby Herman shows up to tell him Acme had a will leaving Toontown to the tunes, and that's the reason he was killed off. Why don't you run downstairs and get me a racing form? Oh! Even babies didn't treat women like people back then. Eh, who says they do now, actually? Upon further inspection, oh, God. Herman was right, and upon even more inspection, he finds Roger hiding out at his place. When a two's in trouble, there's only one place to go. Valiant and Valiant. Not anymore. I suppose this is as good a time as any to talk about the phenomenal animation and the amazing support it had. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you have the animation itself. Which, keep in mind, there was no CGI back then to measure the lighting or geometric placement of where they should be. Yet, when they showed the first test to producers, some of them legitimately asked, Who's the guy in the rabbit suit? And you're not gonna get away from me again! This time... Part of that is because another version of the film was shot with stand-ins to get an idea of where they would be and how the lighting would hit them. Compare this to, say, Tom and Jerry, where they move funny but never fully look like they're there. Here, even in scenes where Zemeckis wanted to show off by having lighting constantly change, you completely... I love the fact that the lighting on the rat on Roger, whenever the light he dings the light up here, it moves back and forth. Watch the light on Roger. It stays in sync with the scene all the way through. Scenes where Zemeckis wanted yeah. to show off by having lighting Look at that! Changed. Look at that! Again, I cannot stress enough the freaking amazing quality that this film has and still holds up with even over 30 years later. Oh, I just, uh, I just had that existential crisis moment where I realized how old I am. Ugh, I'm 30 freaking three years old. I need to stop. I completely believe they're sharing the same space, even getting the shadows and reflections down. Second is the support behind the animation. 
on top of the actors. Brilliant conviction, making you believe they're looking at something that's not there. Just watch actors with Jar Jar to figure out how tricky this can be. Mm -hmm. There was tons of miming, strings, and inventive mechanics to manipulate the world around them. Eddie's cuffs in this scene, for example, are just a sculpture frozen in this protruding position, as these two would constantly be struggling away from each other, so it would naturally be in that position. You don't think of these details as a kid, and sometimes you don't even think of them as an adult, which is a clear sign of how amazing a job the film is doing. Step out of line and we'll hang you and your laundry out to dry. After they escape the weasels, Eddie takes Roger to the bar. But tell me, Eddie, is that a rabbit in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? Can it be both? <laughs> They get out yes. of the cuffs and Eddie asks Dolores to check on Acme's probate. Yeah, check the probate. Why, my Uncle Thumper had a problem with his probate. Wait, it's not the same Thumper I'm thinking of, is it? No, no, totally unrelated. You embarrassed me, boy! Bite my fluffy tail, you Peter Rabbit reject! You would be nothing oh, you without come down me! Here? Do you know the come things on down. I had to do come it? I'm gonna just you pretend this isn't happening. Get the Nicholas Cage to my you. Francis Bring your fluffy ass dickhole! Here. Jessica visits Eddie to ask him to find Roger. Now, if you're wondering why he's getting out of the shower here, it's because there's a very long deleted scene where he's taken to Toontown as torture, putting a giant pig head on him that washes off in the shower. This was cut because it's fucking bizarre. There's no reason to have it in the film. It gives away part of the reveal of Toontown. And even Hoskins' accent and Lloyd's acting seem a little off. Rummaging around in a lady's dressing room. Tisk, tisk, tisk. If I'd have wanted underwear, I'd have broken into Fredericks of Hollywood. Now, if you excuse me, I've got to go back to the British part of California. Broken into Fredericks of Hollywood. Now, if you excuse me, I've got to go back to the British part of California. Yeah, Hoskins' accent, I heard it a little bit, but I didn't care. I mean, honestly, Hoskins, I always liked Hoskins as an actor. This is where Jessica says, in my opinion, one of the odder lines to become famous. It's not bad, it's just weird that this is the one everyone remembers. I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I'm just, I'm just drawn, drawn that, that way. How Frank Miller's later characters would talk. Oh! Dolores catches Eddie seemingly hitting on Jessica, and thank Jesus this misunderstanding only lasts a few seconds. I think the film itself even forgot it put it in there. I get the feeling this moment exists only for this one scene. Sorry. 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 Jesus. Only for this one scene. Sorry. 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 Oh, sorry. It glitches there because it's been rewound so much. No reason. <laughs> Doug. Come on. Roger can't help but entertain, and he outs himself at the bar, getting the attention of... Wore out the pause button. Michelangelo would rat on you for a nickel. Not Angelo, he never turned me in. I enjoy how Roger discusses the importance of winning people over through laughter, and yes, while standing on a soapbox. But it shows Eddie it can win someone even like Angelo over, who won't turn him in because of it. Again, foreshadowing the importance of utilizing humor. Plus Doom using this vet's missing arm to erase the board. That's a just dick. dick. A rabbit is to come right to me. Doom has a plan to draw him out, though. No two can resist the old shave and a haircut. That's why neither the weasels nor I will fall for it. Oh, uh, that is, by I, I mean you. Roger falls for the trick, but Eddie remembers two that he goes crazy bits. whenever he takes a shot of bourbon. Barbara. Fine time for a drink, Eddie. Maybe you'd like a bowl of pretzels to go with it. Just pour the drink, Dolores. And yes, a bowl of pretzels would be great. Oh. The drink works as Eddie fights off the weasels. Can they locate Roger's pal Benny in Doom's van? Benny, look out for the no! This seems pretty awesome because it's not just a chase, it's a cartoon chase. Yes! Animated logic has to be utilized all the time, even to the point where Eddie becomes a cartoon every once in a while. Oh, that's right. They make their escape and hide out in a nearby theater. Nobody takes a ball up like Goofy. What timing? What a genius! Too bad he's a communist. Wait, was he cleared of those spy charges? Drop the piano on us from 15 stories. Eddie revealed that his prejudice was because his brother was killed by a tune who was never identified. And I don't know why, but this inappropriate joke in this serious scene really makes me laugh hard. Only he got the drop on us. Literally. Literally. <laughs> drop on us! And you said your sense of humor was gone! 
Because your brother is dead! Eddie figures out that R.K. Maroon has a part to play in this crime, and he meets up with him, saying he has the will. Which he actually does with Roger's letter to Jessica, but nobody knows that yet. But Maroon is, well, a Maroon and gets jumped by him. I'm gonna listen to you spin the Cloverleaf scenario. A story of greed, sex, and murder. Well, greed, patty cake, and murder. Unless that's an art-deleted scene. Oh. Maroon is shot, and the killer drives into Toontown. Eddie confronts <clears throat> his prejudice, pulls out a Toon gun, and even... Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, Nick was uh, dropping off my grub. Uh, got it from Sheets. And, uh, yeah. It's a uh, good day for some grub. <clears throat> Wouldn't it have been hilarious if I would have actually ordered DoorDash during this, not knowing that DoorDash was one of the sponsors? But it's too late for DoorDash because, uh, you know, not a lot of places are open. Although I think DoorDash would do deliveries with Sheets, maybe? I don't know. I really don't know. But either way... Uh, there's actually one little uh, thing that I, I hope Doug mentions it, but if he doesn't, I'll Shot just briefly talk about it. Thanks for getting me... Uh, thanks for getting me out of the hoose gal, uh, Yosemite Sam, and he gets an animated gun. That's awesome. I love that. And also, the bullets are animated, and they're all like stereotypes of like Western characters. You know, you got the prospector characters like... We been bamboozled. And you got the, the American Indian character who uses the tomahawk to destroy the bottle. I love it. I love it so much. He confronts his prejudice, pulls out a toon gun, and even pours out the rest of his alcohol. See, folks, it's easy. You don't need 12 steps. Just stop being racist. I'm not sure what they were trying to say here. Well, well I mean, I think it's... It, I don't think it's like trying to confront the 12 steps. I, I think, unless Doug's just making a joke here. But I think it's more along the line, lines of him saying, I'm resisting for now. I don't need it. I don't need it for this. It's, sometimes it is that simple, sometimes it isn't. It varies from person to person. And then, of course, there's Toontown, which... He enters Toontown filled with Disney archive footage that maybe they should have looked a little closer at. Hey, it's a 40s film about racism. Kind of works. And he thinks he tracks down Jessica, but it's not. Mina Hyena. He escapes to one of my favorite shows. <laughs> yes. Jokes in the movie. I love it. across a moment you will never see ever again. Ever. What's up, Doc? Warner Brothers and Disney working together. To Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck in the same scene as Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck is that they had to share the exact same amount of screen time. That's why you rarely see them alone and they're often side by side. Even after Donald gets his alone time on screen, Daffy needs the exact same amount of alone time as well. But the Disney movie, Mickey is shown just a few seconds earlier. Proving again the mouse always needs to be number one. No Brooklyn accented puppy cheeked unionist is gonna upstage my goddamn wholesomeness! Wait, is someone recording this? Oh, you. I'll get him. Should probably ignore I have that. Yeah. I will give credit that they made Mickey dark enough that he smiles at Bugs' almost fatal prank. Aw, poor fella. Uh -huh. Yeah, ain't I a stinker? Ha <laughs> ha, we just killed a man. Ha <laughs> ha, that's not out of the ordinary. Ha <laughs> ha. He's saved, but he outwits the imposter and continues his search for Jessica, who he thinks shot Maroon. Yeah, where's your editing on that, Disney Plus? I always knew I'd get it in Toon Town. Or... That. Is that a rabbit in your pocket? You're just happy to see me. Behind you! Jessica reveals it was Doom who killed R.K. Maroon as they tried to outrun the weasels and search for Roger. I have to find my darling husband. I'm so worried about him. Oh no, are they gonna. Is Doug gonna mention the part where. Um. Uh. Let's just see. Seriously? What are you seeing, that guy? He's got a big dick. He makes me laugh. There's a reason he wears pants that baggy. Doom stops them by, wait, wait, I got one more. You know how when you pull out a mallet, it's really tiny in your pocket, but then when it's out, it's like gigantic? Doom wow. stops them by pouring dip on Benny's tires, and don't pause this scene on VHS. It'll grow up your kids too early. Not my difficult. Uh, uh, he mentioned it, but oh God, how it's been edited and how it's been edited over time, which thank goodness, man. Just a stupid love letter. Doom reveals that without the will, he'll be the owner of Toontown and plans to obliterate it to put up a freeway. 
most likely a commentary on gentrification and not caring for the people who live there. Again, tying back into the racism allegory. No one's going to notice Toontown's disappeared. Who's got time to wonder what happened to some mice when you're driving by at 75 miles an hour? How else could you explain words like this suddenly sounding evil? Inexpensive motels, restaurants that serve rapidly prepared food, and wonderful billboards. My god, it sounds a lot like Disney. Roger tries to save the day, but he gets captured as well. T a literal ton of bricks. To silly side, it makes the weasels literally laugh themselves to death. But then Doom enters the picture and... He defeats it. Yeah, pretty easy actually. Nothing too difficult. Well, that's not what happens. Yes it is. Why don't you want to talk about... No, that's really it. Nothing else. No, no, Mr. Critic, there's so Oh much god, fun. no! You know what scene you're leaving out. No, 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 there's really no scene. Oh dear. Perhaps did you repress this? <laughs> me, critic! When I killed your childhood, I talked just like that! That's what got you, Doug? Alright. Let's talk about this scene. <laughs> After a suspenseful fight with some damn good effects of Doom getting flattened and getting back up, he's revealed to be a toon. And did I say the shoe scene scar childhoods? This one Adam bombed it. Many kids, and even adults, were terrified at honestly a simple effect, but so effectively done. So I this one didn't affect me that bad, Doug. This one didn't affect me. I, I, I mean, honestly, I saw this and I was just like, holy crap, Doom's a tune. Holy crap, how did he... I, at first I was like, Horrified, I was more horrified by the steamroller going over and just Christopher Lloyd just, oh, 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 and just getting run over. But then when I, when this was revealed, I was just like, oh my gosh, it makes, it makes all the sense. Ugh. I always wondered what kind of Inspector Gadget tune he was supposed to be. Nothing compared to the nightmare impact he left behind. The only thing scarier, Lloyd's face without the animation. Jesus! That is pretty this will terrifying. This forever go down in history as one of the most terrifying things ever put in any kid-ish media. There. Was that so bad? I don't know. You want to clean up my seat? I'm good. I could use the money. And he sprays Five bucks. cooler all over the place and Doom's finally defeated. Still quoting than the Nintendo game. <laughs> the police Qu goes out quoting the, uh... <laughs> Quoting the Wicked Witch of the West, which, okay. These and the tunes arrived to discover not only was Doom responsible for Acme's murder, but the will was Roger's letter to Jessica with disappearing, reappearing ink. <laughs> Yay! Woo! Bugs doesn't seem too happy. Maybe he was like, eh, I invested in clover leaf. That was a pretty funny dance he did for the weasels. And he also seems to have gotten his sense of humor back until Roger zaps him with a hand buzzer. Don't tell me you lost your sense of humor already. Does this answer your question? Does this answer your question? <laughs> no, he's still a good sport. The tunes sing absolutely nobody's favorite song, and that freeway idea will never fuck up California in any way possible. Oh. Gotta love, too, how they couldn't let a Warner Brothers character have the final scene. Yeah, he gets the last line, but it's Tinkerbell who gets the last frame of film. Even though Peter Pan wasn't released until six years later. But, oh, time has no place in Neverland. It's a low blow. Eh. The credits roll, and everyone's thankful for great talents like Robert Zemeckis, Steven Spielberg, and Kathleen Kennedy? Producer in really name, and here's the thing: I don't, I, I love Kathleen Kennedy's work before she did Star Wars. I'm just gonna be honest. But mm, let's see what Doug has to say. Huh? Actually, she produced a lot of amazing things. But people don't like her now because of Star Wars. There must be something she produced that was bad to make this joke work. Okay, that feels better. Yeah. Oh, she's produced plenty of bombs, Doug. She has produced plenty of bad films. I mean. There, I think there's a there's an artistic time timetable for all artists. All artists have a peak, and sometimes you know they hit their peak, and then after they're not able to entertain anyone anymore. For instance, Francis Ford Coppola. 
<clears throat> he hit a home run with The Godfather, and he did great work. But there was a problem. After after he made his films and all that, he settled, and he became just a name, Francis Ford Coppola, and he didn't take directing as serious. Same thing with John Singleton. John Singleton peaked with his first film. John Singleton peaked with Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood is a tremendous film. And then you look at John Singleton's work after that, and for the most part, it's just a slight downhill until eventually he bottomed out with uh, with uh, Too Fast, Too Furious, and uh, a few other films that just... Uh, Abduction, I think, was his last film before he died, which sucks bad, man, because... I loved John Singleton's work, but Robert Zemeckis, I think Robert Zemeckis, again, another example, Robert Zemeckis hit his peak here, and then he went in with Forrest Gump, and he kept going and going, and then around the mid-2000s to around 2010, he sort of hit a brick wall creatively, and he tried to do the Polar Express thing where he tried to, I can understand and want him to, you know, I want him to succeed with the art that he does, but if it's not good, then it's not good. Kathleen Kennedy, it's the same deal. Whenever she's not working with great names like Steven Spielberg or anything like that, whenever there's not... Now, because of Star he produced a lot of... And Kathleen Kennedy? Huh. So, yeah, Jurassic Park, that was, uh, that was I think, uh, you know, right there, Kathleen Kennedy, she was working with Steven Spielberg, she was working with Michael Crichton, she was working with... Uh, yeah, she was working with... A lot of great people there. Actually, Back to the Future, Robert Zemeckis, and she was also working with... Uh, she produced... And then this one here, again, I think this proves my theory of, you know, artists having that peak, and then eventually just, like... Sometimes the decline is more, like, is reticent, and then it sometimes can be a sharp decline in quality. And I think here, this is a perfect example of, of that with The Sixth Sense. It's a lot of amazing things. Persepolis? Persepolis is actually a pretty damn good film. I watched it, and I was genuinely surprised by how good it was. Thanks. But in terms of, you know, and I think there is an exception to the rule, and I think it's because he evolves with the art form, and he keeps making great films. It, you see... Great filmmakers can have, like, a, a truly good filmmaker can have a a uh, a watershed film uh, every dec, you know, a decade, you know, and, and like in the seventies, yeah, if you can produce one great film, like, and you know, you have that great decade, that's that's one thing. But then there's one person who I think keeps producing great films after great films after great films. Uh, and he goes through evolutions where he grows as a filmmaker, still, Martin Scorsese. Because when you look back at Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, when you look at uh, Goodfellas, when you look at The Departed, when you look at Hugo, when you look at Silence, and when, when you look even today at, uh, at um, The Irishman, so many great films have been produced by Martin Scorsese, and... He keeps evolving as an artist, and I appreciate that about him. That's one thing I will always say about Martin Scorsese, is that he's a great artist. Also, this face from Doug is priceless. Sorry, let's move on. But people don't like her now because of Star Wars. There must be something she produced that was bad to make this joke work. Okay, that feels better. Who Frame Roger Rabbit may not have jump-started a new evolution in film, but honestly, that might be one of the reasons it's so one-of-a-kind. On a technical level, it's truly unique, as no mix of live action and 2D animation has ever looked this good or had this many crossovers. On a storytelling level, it's also amazing how to get across so much character and information in such a tight amount of time without having to over-explain anything. It's also impressive that a character like Roger doesn't become annoying. He's still authentic of that time period, but is perfectly funny and agitating in the way the film needs. All the acting is stellar, it's wildly imaginative, it looks amazing, even the music is absolute first-rate. Even though this movie won't start any cinematic universes, it still works on a variety of levels. So, if yeah. you haven't seen it in a while, take another watch and rediscover the best of your childhood with just the right amount of an adult edge. It's great. It well, truly is. those are some very kind things to say. Well, I 
really think you and this movie have made a much bigger impact than you probably give credit for. Honey bunny, let's play. All right, be right there. Oh, right, you're married to Jessica. Yeah, but I still got a rough life. No, you don't. You're right. Honey bunny. On my way, figure eight, buddy. <sighs> Why the hell did I feel sorry for him? Because he was a drunk. Booga booga! Burn. So there we go. Uh, that was Nostalgia Critics uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Dude, this film still blows me away. I have no words to say. I mean, this just... Doug, thank you for covering this. Thank you for, you know, looking at this through... Not with nostalgia-filled goggles, even though your name's a nostalgia critic. I mean, thank you for being honest about this, you know, showing its imperfections, but being honest enough. About, and again, you know, I love, I love this man. I love, I love when Doug does films like this and he's able to deep dive into the history of stuff and we're able to just, oh, I love it. Anyway, I think it's going to do it, everyone. This was Who Framed Roger Rabbit by the Nostalgia Critic. Uh, if you want to see more from Doug Walker and the rest of the crew at Channel Awesome, feel free to click their name in the title of the video. And if you want to see more from us, feel free to uh, yeah hit that subscribe button, ring that bell to stay notified, leave a like on the video. It helps us out a whole heap and ton. And I guess until next time, signing off, I'm Nate. I'll see you then. Peace out.